Marhaban wa ahlan bukum fi barnamij dakhil Washington. Ma'akum mudifakum Robert Satloff. Akbar Masule umanna el kalmi wazir al kharijia Anthony Blinken wa wazir al dafa Lloyd Austin safru il kharij lil mara al ula wa safaran sawiya wa jahatuhuma kanat asia wa dahafuma kan irsal risalat an al tahawul al hadith fi al awliyat al kalmiyat intikalan min khaud al harb al irhab illa muwajahat al sin al tahaddi al kabir lil kanun al hadi wa al shroom hal sin adu am khasam nad am munafis hal taqtid min janib pekin askari am aktisadi am diplomasi am kul masabik hal satandam rusia il sin fi muhajahat america am on vladimir putin ladehi tamuhatihi al mustakilla al khasa وهل يمكن للولايات المتحدة فعلا الفرار من مشاكل الشرق الأوسط بما فيها الهروب والإرهاب والتطرف ومشاكل الدول الفاشلة أم أن الشرق الأوسط سيجذبنا من جديد الرغم من بذلنا كسار جهدنا المناقشة السياسة الخارجية لإدارة بايدن في ظل الأوضاء العالمية سريعة التغير يسرني أن أراهب بخابري الأمن القومي دينيس روس ووان زراتي Welcome back to Dachel Washington Well, an unusual first trip our secretaries of state and defense traveled together abroad recently and their target was Asia Are they sending a message? Does this underscore a pivot to that continent? What does this mean for the direction of Biden administration foreign policy? To discuss all this, I'm delighted to welcome Juan Zarate and Dennis Ross. Gentlemen, welcome back to the show. So Juan, why is it significant that uh, Messrs. Blinken and Austin are traveling together and their first stop is on the other side of the world in Asia? Rob, I think it represents, again, what the Obama administration tried to do and say, which was American foreign policy needs to shift toward Asia. The, the pivot toward Asia is real. And the focus on the challenges and, to a certain extent, threats from China are central now to American national security and national economic security. So I think the, the message is very, uh, very real that that's where U.S. focus will be strategically. And it also coincided with the meeting of the Quad, that is to say the leaders of India, Japan, Australia, and the U.S. Uh, virtually, uh, but a very clear signal that that, uh, that coalition, that alliance, which, by the way, started in the Bush administration back in 2004 with an attempt uh, to create greater relations with India, um, is really going to become a hallmark alliance as all four countries deal with the challenge and what is now perceived to be a growing threat from China. So I think the message is very strong and real that Asia is going to be a major focus for the Biden administration. So, uh, Dennis, uh, Juan twice used the term alliance. Um, is that a, um, a word that we can use to characterize this, uh, this grouping of the, uh, these four major Pacific, Indo-Pacific nations? You know, I don't know if we can formally use it that way, but as a as a as a partnership, as a new collaborative mechanism, uh, it clearly is taking on a life of its own. As Juan said, this was something that was originally created back in the Bush administration. Uh, it is very interesting that this was one of the first moves that was made with the leaders by the Biden administration. Uh, it's actually quite striking that this would be the very first quasi-summit, virtual summit, uh, that would be held by the president with other leaders. So clearly there's an effort to invest in it, number one. And as Juan was saying, the fact that the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense traveled together, uh, both to Japan and to South Korea, so early in the administration is an unmistakable statement. And it's not just the issue of sort of elevating Asia. 
It is the issue of making it clear we are going to compete with China. We're going to compete with China across the board, politically, economically, and militarily. Uh, Ron, I, I was just going to say what, what's really interesting is the alliance or alliances or or, or uh, alignment of these interests in some ways have been very reactive to Chinese pressure, and so there's been a lot of emphasis on uh, naval exercises, naval defense, uh, dealing with pressure from the Chinese. Uh, on the human rights front, even on uh, data surveillance. Uh, what's interesting with what came out of the qu latest Quad meeting was a very proactive set of measures on vaccine diplomacy, uh, which counters what China is trying to do with its own Sinovax, using vaccine diplomacy uh, to enter markets, to ingratiate themselves, to create diplomatic openings. So I, I find it fascinating that it's not just about naval exercises, you now have uh, those four countries uh, working together for the deployment of vaccines together um, in Southeast Asia and uh, other parts of Asia for purposes of countering to a cer certain extent what China is trying to do diplomatically. Now, interestingly, uh, when the leaders of these four countries jointly signed an op-ed and an editorial in a major American newspaper, the word China was not mentioned. Um, uh, so how do you see the evolving Biden administration approach to China? I know I think I've asked you before, but perhaps we have an updated view. Um, enemy, adversary, rival, competitor, where on the spectrum are we today? Dennis? Look, what I'm really struck by is how tough the language is. Uh, that the administration has been adopting and including uh, the statements that the Secretary of State made in Japan, uh, as well as what uh, Secretary Austin of Defense also said. They're very blunt uh, about what, chi what China is doing in terms of human rights abuses, very blunt in terms of their challenge to uh, navigation, what they're doing in the, both the East and South China Seas, even in the Taiwan Straits, we've now had, since Biden has been president, the third time we've sent a, a ship into the Taiwan Straits. So there is a, a very explicit posture making it clear those Chinese behaviors that we reject and that we're going to counter. So I don't know that we can reduce this to one word. I mean, frenemy is not exactly something that's gonna fit here, but it is, it is a relationship that's gonna be characterized by both competition and cooperation. The cooperation is necessary on pandemics, which are not gonna go away. And Juan, when you look at what the administration is doing, do you see here more continuity or more change from the Trump administration's approach to China? Rob, Rob I think, and we've talked about it here uh, together, uh, there is fundamental continuity at the end of the day. I think there, there is going to be some change in emphasis, nuance, even tonality certainly with what the Biden administration does. And I do think that with the Quad and in general, there's going to be a sense that there's no need to poke the Chinese unnecessarily, right? There's no need to create tension or crisis or conflict where there doesn't need to be. But there is fundamental continuity. And, and I think there's three reasons, Rob. I, one is I think there's bipartisan appreciation for the challenge of China. There's debates as to what that really means. But fundamentally and politically in the United States, there is a focus on China uh, that, that looks like consensus around the need to focus on China and the challenge of China. Secondly, there's embedded in American processes and law things that are already required. So, for example, the Hong Kong Autonomy Act passed by Congress requires the executive, whether it was the Trump administration or now the Biden administration, to issue certain reports and to list certain Chinese officials, which the Biden administration is doing for violations of Chinese obligations with respect to Hong Kong and human rights. So that will continue. And we have investigations ongoing, for example, the Huawei investigation, which is not going away. So there's continuity by law and process in the American system. And I think the very dint of Chinese behavior, which isn't changing and is reflected in Xi Jinping's five-year plan, which is kind of a strategic decoupling, uh, you know, reducing dependence on uh, foreign sources of technology and resources 
and at the same time creating greater dependencies uh, internationally on Chinese technology resources and human capital. Uh, that is going to continue uh, while China seems to continue to pressure and bully to a certain extent their neighbors and even the European Union. You see this now, Rob, with a debate around whether or not the European Union will impose sanctions for human rights violations uh, for what's happening with the Uyghurs in Western China. Uh, Beijing is rattling its saber a bit, economic saber and others, uh, to warn against that kind of activity. So China is not going to stop in its activities and that will continue um, to force the US and other allies to respond and that will represent continuity. All right, when we come back after the break, we're gonna continue this conversation and expand it to look at the implications of this focus on China on all the other regions of the world that have a demand on the Biden administration's attention in just a moment. Recognizing anniversaries is one very effective way to remember the past. It works both for celebratory events and tragedies. With that in mind, let's recall what happened almost exactly 40 years ago when President Ronald Reagan, then the oldest man ever to hold office, emerged from his limousine to walk into the Washington Hilton Hotel a few blocks from the White House. A young man emerged from the crowd, lifted a pistol, and fired, hitting the president in the chest, wounding two police officers, and severely disabling the White House press secretary, Jim Brady, with a shot to the head. The man was John W. Hinckley. He was mentally ill. The shooting was reportedly a way to impress actress Jodie Foster, with whom he was obsessed. Thankfully, Reagan survived, thanks to the emergency doctors of George Washington University Hospital and a dose of good luck. The bullet just missed killing him. Brady dealt with the impact of the shooting for the rest of his life, which he devoted to sensible gun control, successfully lobbying for the passage of what became known as the Brady Bill, which required federal background checks on weapons purchases. As for Hinckley, my own first brush with real journalism was when, as a college reporter, I tried to get close to him when he was sent for psychiatric evaluation at the federal prison facility in Butner, North Carolina. I didn't succeed, but I did a great story anyway. Hinckley was found not guilty by reason of insanity and he spent more than 30 years in a psychiatric facility. In 2016, he was released to his mother's care. Thankfully, this is a story we remember, a story of a tragedy that could have been a lot worse. Welcome back to Dachau, Washington. My guests today include Dennis Ross, Dennis is my colleague and counselor to the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Dennis has 25 years of bipartisan experience at high levels of government, including White House tours in the Obama, Clinton, Bush, and Reagan administrations, and service as the president's special envoy for Middle East peace. Also joining us is Juan Zarate. Juan is one of our nation's leading national security experts. A former Harvard baseball star, he is global managing partner of K2 Integrity, an international risk management firm. Juan is also chairman of the Center on Economic and Financial Power and senior national security analyst for NBC News. He served as White House counterterrorism czar in the George W. Bush administration. All right, Dennis. Um, while there's all this focus on China, a, a report just came out from the intelligence community in the United States saying that Russia, not China, Russia was the main foreign actor trying to undermine America's election in 2020. Does this make sense? And what are the implications of this finding? First, it shouldn't come as a surprise because the Russians did this in 2016 as well. Uh, and and there's no question that they viewed uh, Trump versus Biden as 
Trump serving their interests, whether it was by design or through the this kind of chaotic effect of the policies uh, and even the discrediting of the U.S. in many respects internationally with its allies. The Russians saw a, a second Trump term as very much serving a surprise that they were active in this. And it's not a surprise also in the sense that Biden was out there being very critical during the campaign and making it clear that uh, Russia would face a much tougher policy from the United States if he were president. So it should come as no surprise. What is interesting in that report is that China played, China sort of made a decision not to involve itself, uh, concluding that it would be counterproductive if they were to do so. But what I noted that was interesting was that the Iranians at the end made an effort on behalf of Biden in a kind of, you know, they, they, they were trying to scare <laughs> they were trying to scare voters into into somehow uh, somehow voting in the end for Trump. I'm sorry. Uh, the, the Iran was trying very hard to convince voters that they needed to vote for Biden uh, using a kind of a strange way of, of using disinformation. One, let, let me ask you um, uh, this focus early on on Asia with uh, the Blinken and, and Austin trips, et cetera. Um, uh, to some extent, it's uh, it's a desire also to escape all the world's other problems, um, Europe, uh, the Middle East, uh, Latin America, whatever. How are we doing on that front? Well, I think it's, as Dennis has said before on, on our programs and, and our discussions, you know, every every president wants to escape the crises and conflicts of the Middle East. Um, or the challenges and the rifts of, of Europe, or the transnational challenges of refugees and other uh, uh, challenges that affect and afflict other parts of the of the world. And so, you know, that that is always the desire, the desire to begin to focus on the broader strategic long-term goals. And that's why you have this focus on the Indo-Pacific region. But the reality, Rob, is you have conflicts and challenges that require American attention, or at least implicate American interests, regardless of where the administration wants to focus its time and attention. And so you have the question of the Iran nuclear deal and, and Iran, uh, Iranian belligerence and adventurism. Uh, you've got the question of the conflict in Yemen with the Houthis on the march launching uh, attacks into uh, Saudi oil fields. You've got challenges in, in Europe uh, with respect to refugees, you still have the challenge of the direction of Turkey uh, and, and where Turkey is headed. Um, in Latin America, you've got a, a, a now raging problem again of uh, refugees and migrants coming to the U.S. southern border. So there are issues that the administration will have to deal with, like it or not. Um, and the real challenge for any White House, any administration, is how to balance time and attention and energy, understanding there's limited capital, limited time. And in this point in the administration, limited number of officials in appointed positions to actually execute policy. And I think that's a real challenge for the administration right now, how to get the assistant secretaries, the undersecretaries, the key officials out into uh, the agencies and into the uh, international domain to execute policy. We're not there yet, and I worry about uh, the ability to manage multiple crises at once. And so far, uh, President Biden has done virtual meetings with uh, with some leaders. Any plans uh, for for him to travel that we know of yet, uh, Dennis? Um, there are plans for him to travel. Uh, they are the initial trips will be to Europe uh, starting in June, uh, and in a sense, it's kind of an interesting reminder that you may want. China to be the, the main focus and main priority. But again, because this administration is defining an element of its strategy is the renewal of alliances, which then allow it to be more effective in terms of competing with the Chinese, with the Russians, and dealing with what are these transnational issues and including issues particularly like climate change. So I do believe we will see more travel beyond that. Uh, the interesting thing will be, as Juan was getting at, how do those areas that have not been defined as being part of the priority, when they impose themselves on, on the administration's agenda, as they will, what is the role of the president going to be? 
How visible will he be? How active will he be? Will we see any travel as it relates to those areas? All right, we're going to have to stop there. Um, this is a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much, Juan Zarate, Dennis Ross, for helping to explain these shifts in American foreign policy to our Middle Eastern audience. Thank you. A couple of days ago, at 12.01 a.m., I pressed a keystroke on my computer and struck gold. Day after day of surfing websites of hospitals, pharmacies, and mass vaccination sites in the state of Maryland. And after pre-registering on numerous government and private sector apps, I nabbed myself a coveted appointment to receive the first dose of the coronavirus vaccine. I will go with all the documentation needed to prove my eligibility, and hopefully I will walk away with a shot in the arm, both literally and figuratively. It will be my transition from seeing the world as a dark tunnel to seeing the light at its end. As I proceed down this path, the multiple shots, the aftermath, the waiting period, finally my hoped for emergence as a vaccinated person in a still partially vaccinated country, it's my intention to talk periodically about the process. I readily admit that I didn't see this coming. I was one of those naive enough to think that when we were sent home a year ago, it would be for a few weeks at most, perhaps even a few months, and that the numbers of victims may be terrible, but would never hit six digits. As we zoomed past half a million, it was a long time already since I realized that I was wrong, so very wrong. This has been a profoundly humbling experience, a powerful reminder of how we are shaped by forces often beyond our control. But this has also been an ennobling, empowering experience, as we have all had to figure out for ourselves how best to survive, and if possible, thrive under these terrible circumstances. We've all had new rules to live by, some imposed by government, some by convention, some by friends and family, some by our own sense of right and wrong, practical and impractical. It's tough to imagine a family not touched by some loss during this past year. Similarly, it's tough to imagine a family that didn't experience, or even better, didn't commit some unusual act of kindness, often involving a stranger, a delivery person, a mail carrier, a healthcare worker, a neighbor. At all levels, government, communities, businesses, and families, the discussion of the day is about what new rules will govern the post-vaccination world. Will we all go back to the office, still work at home, or find some hybrid? Will we still avoid crowds, or will we revel in the adrenaline that comes with beaches, stadiums, and concert halls? Will we ever shake hands again? We'll talk about all this in the months ahead. For now, my simple hope is that we take the fullness of our experience over the past year into our discussion of the new rules. The worst has been horrible. The best has been remarkable. We need to remember it all. Bahava Nasalu al Nehayat Havahil Halka Min Baranamij Dachel Washington. I the Kenet Ladekum E Estaf Sarat, O Ta'alikat, Hau Havahil Halka. While Hasitan Hau Daur Hukukulin San, Fil Siasatl Kharajia, El Merikia, El Yom. Arjuan Tatawasalum Mai, Aber Twitter, Allah hashtag Inside Washington. O An Tarasaluni Muba Sharatan, Allah at Rob Satloff. Sa rakumalos boil book bill, wa ila anal kakum, shukran lakum, wa ila lekah.